Hi, my name is Tim Lapatino, and today I'm interviewing Brett Bonowitz, who is the director of the documentary Closer Than We Think about artist and futurist Arthur Radabaugh. Uh, Brett, thanks so much for taking the time to talk today. I'm excited. You know, Arthur Radabaugh and his work are sort of near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's really good to talk to you about this. And I wanted to sort of share some of the genesis of this documentary project. But let's let's back up a little bit and tell me how did you discover Art Radabaugh's work? So I, I believe this is right that the the first time that I ever really saw it was on Matt Novak's Paleo Future blog, and I had been um, looking for artwork for uh, the main character of my previous film, The Perfect Forty Six, and uh, you know really kind of fell in love with with Radabaugh's Closer Than We Think work, and uh, we ultimately didn't end up using you know any of that work you know for the main character's office we're going to take one of the strips blow it up really big put it in the background or something and that ultimately didn't really work out or you know to the favor of the film but uh i started collecting um that work you know just like finding strips on ebay or something and you know from there you just kind of you know i think at one point i had a few of them framed and you, you know so like you're just kind of looking at them on the wall and you're like I'd like to know more, like, who is that person? You know, like, I'll be able to find, you know, like a, a little video of uh, him talking about the work. And I was never able to find, you know, anything about him, you know, talking about it, you know, in that capacity. And that just kind of, you know, made that itch, you know, a little bit deeper, you know, it's like more mosquito bites or something. And you just want to find out more about him and be like, Oh, how is this a mystery? Like, what, what, you know, this isn't that long ago. And that just started like the odyssey of like, well, why don't I try to make a film about this? You know, what's there, you know, are there, is there anybody to talk to, you know, uh, how many strips can we find? Uh, how much art did he do? You know, when was he active? And you just start peeling away those layers and I, I think just as uh, someone with curiosity, it was a great story to dig into because you get so much of uh, American history at a certain point, but also it's just so bizarre how there's very little uh, about the man, you know? And, and I think that, that kept my intrigue through, you know, years of research. Yeah, so it seems like because of the vacuum of knowledge, like it was, it was much more interesting to you than just looking him up on Wikipedia and reading a few paragraphs and then moving on. Sort of the fact that there was, you know, there was this mystery here sort of lend, put you down that rabbit hole. Yeah, and I think, I think you ended up doing a similar thing, but like, you know, eventually I, you know, started a spreadsheet of like, and it became this wonderful investigation, you know, like I couldn't find any listing of anybody doing like, well, when exactly did it run? You know, like when exactly did it start and finish? So like you start, you know, being like, okay, electric small cars was on this date, you know, and you're like, okay, well, this has to be a Sunday. And, you know, like it ran for this many years. And, you know, some of the strips, um, we should say, I guess that Arthur Radabaugh did a comic strip called closer than we think that yes. ran from 1958 to 1963 but um you you know you, you see like at the bottom you know say like next week you know shopper hoppers and you're like okay i don't have that i've never seen that uh let me type that in and i know that it's that and you start filling in all these blanks and it was just this i don't know this like a wonderful hobby to like take my mind off of whatever else was going on in my life at the time and I was able to really be enveloped in this world of Arthur Radabaugh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think it's so interesting. I had a similar experience and we can talk more about this, but just seeing his art for the first time, you know, I saw it as part of this exhibit that Todd Kimmel did and I was just amazed by it. And it looked like something I had seen before. It had a familiarity to it. But yet it was also totally different and totally unique, you know, and I, so I came to it seeing his airbrush artwork and then going back and discovering, oh, he did a, you know, a syndicated strip that ran several years in newspapers all over the country and, you know, it seems like in the world, I mean, at least we know Canada for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like that discovery is so interesting and there's something 
fascinating about sort of adding to the pop culture body of knowledge, right? Where, because no one else had done this, this research, no one had done this work, at least that we could find out there in sort of the internet. And so you started doing that and t talk to me about that. Like what, you know, you're, you're interested in sort of futurism <clears throat> as a whole, but what was it about sort of creating, so, you know, sort of documenting this history for the first time as well? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, it all kind of started organically for me, you know, like I couldn't really find anything, you know, and then it was, you know, like you only really found like three people to contact on, you know, the entirety of the internet <laughs> that had written about Radabaugh. And, you know, I sent emails to those three people, eventually heard back from them, um, you know, and, and uh, Rachel, uh, I want to say her last name is Macau, um, was the, the first, you know, to really kind of respond and be like, well, who, who are you? What is this? You know? Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I said I was a filmmaker. I was interested in doing this. And, um, you know, obviously they had worked uh, in tandem with Todd. Um, and that was like kind of the first piece in uncovering more, you know, um, contacting Caitlin McGurk, which was another, you know, kind of thing. So she's a, the Billy Ireland um, the cartoon museum for people yes. who don't know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, and, you know, she was like, well, we have all this original artwork, you know, and um, there were just all of these like little pathways that people had done in the past, you know, so like um, uh, Hamp Hampton Waite is another person, you know, that uh, Todd had kind of built on things that Hampton had done as part of research about car illustrators, you know, mm -hmm. so then, you know, Todd had found all of this work uh, of uh, Radabaugh's, uh, where, what was that from, the mid-50s, I think, that, that portfolio was from? Uh, 40s, you know, so like, 50s, yeah. 40s, 50s, you know, so like still pretty closer than we think stuff, you know. Um, I'm trying to remember the first time I heard about Can You Imagine, which is the strip that Radabaugh, you know, did before Closer Than We Think. Um, and I, I don't have like a clear line where I remember finding that, you know. Uh, I think, you know, my most interesting discovery and like it would, it felt like the most original moment because whenever I found somebody, um, you know, they had already like found little pieces and other things. And the, the most original discovery for me was, was finding Jet Swift and his science stamps, which is the strip that Radabaugh did after Closer Than We Think. And that was purely like, I fully remember just like my son was sleeping next to me. I was like on my laptop, just looking through old newspaper archives, going through every week of everything, you know. And <laughs> at, that, at that point, I think we had figured out that it was a January 13th of 63 is the last Closer Than We Think. And, you know, I was like, well, let's just keep going forward. I'm going to go through an entire year, maybe two years, and just keep going and looking through every comic strip and, and really kind of look like, is there a chance that there was one, you know, like one random one and that's the true end? And eventually, you know, like you start to notice like, well, this one, this, this kind of looks sciencey this is interesting okay okay and then you know you're like wait what is the name at the bottom there you know and you're like it says radabaugh you know and you're like but and then you go back you know and, mm -hmm. and then you know you figure out on january 20th in the week after closer than we think ends you get jet swift and that was before we had interviewed caitlin and i remember emailing her you know this so this is all just a part of that journey and and being like, is there? Do you have anything about Jet Swift and his science stamps? And she was like, No, we don't. We don't have anything about that. I don't know. And it was a few days before we interviewed her. She had pulled out. Um, you may have seen it in, on your visit as well. Uh, like there's like that like proof sheets book of like the last year of Closer Than We Think, and tucked in at the end of it is Jet Swift. So yes. she had emailed me like a day before her interview, uh, being like, You're never going to believe this, but. <laughs> we have it and it's here, you know? So that felt like the biggest discovery, you know, like that felt as close to, you know, finding audio or video of him or something like that. You know, it, it, I, I ended up feeling like kind of very, I don't know, in touch with, I don't know, trying to figure out that timeline and figure out exactly what was going on. Although again, so much still remains a mystery. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think this is, you know, I've had a similar experience in some of the other work that I've done. You know, I wrote the book Art of Atari, 
and there is something about treading on ground that feels like okay it's new fallen snow and there are no other footprints right and you're the one asking all these questions and everyone else says well i don't know and you by by virtue of like this snowball now rolling down the hill you've sort of become an expert because you have more you have a lot of questions but you know more than anyone else you're talking to and you're the one who sort of become in charge of putting all these pieces together and saying, you know, oh, I have one interview nugget here. I've got something I found in a newspaper here. You know, we've got this anecdote there. And suddenly you have more of the picture than anyone else, you know, who's probably breathing. How do, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot on, on my shoulders, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and yet still, you know, so many questions remain. And, you know, assuming someone is watching this either before or after watching the film, um, you know, like uh, Arthur Radabaugh remains like this kind of uh, enigmatic character. And I mean, you know, years after finishing this now, I like that, you know, like I, I've grown to enjoy the fact that I don't quite know everything about him, that there are a lot of personal details that, you know, are, are pretty opaque. And uh, I think that's interesting. You know, like I'm working on a film now, like where, uh, the artist family is involved and we know far more details about his life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it, there's, there's less of a mystery. I mean, I think I get to tell a more complete story, but, um, you know, certainly I think the human mind likes those mysterious elements. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally true. Well, before we get too deep down the rabbit hole, why don't we stop and uh, watch the trailer of your film closer than we think and let everyone get it. If they haven't seen it, get a chance to sort of get a taste and then we can come, come back to this conversation. All right. Sounds good. The legacy of Radabaugh is sort of multifaceted. The future killed him while he was creating the future. The future arrived, and he was talking about what would the future look like. But when the future got here, it made him redundant. Comics have, throughout history, been considered a lower art form because they were people think they were just made for kids or made for the masses. Commercially, once the job's over, nobody cares. The honorific keeping of what's been done is, is not that really, not that common. It, it's very hard to predict the future. I've got to believe that there are things that are in the world now that only exist because Radabaugh dreamed them up, put them in a drawing, and then let the rest of us imagine with him what the world with that in it could be. iPhone and, and all kinds of Apple products are direct descendants of the Jetsons, which is a direct descendant of Closer Than We Think. These, these futures are all connected in, in such a way that they're all aspirational things. They're, they're the way that we want to see the world, and they have to exist before we can make them that way. Excellent. Well, let's talk more about this. I mean, talk, tell me about the actual, you know, you've talked about the research, we've talked about, um, you know, what it's like to sort of, you know, walk in this virgin territory and discovering this, this man that really there's not a lot out there about him. Uh, let's talk about actually some of the nuts and bolts of getting a documentary like this made. Like, was a documentary your first you know, instinct. I mean, you're a filmmaker, so that makes sense. But tell me about how that, how you got from there to actually making the film. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, my background was as a filmmaker before making this documentary, not as a documentary filmmaker. This is certainly my first real, like, you know, documentary feature. I think I kind of toyed around with some stuff in film school of, you know, just kind of filming events and then trying to edit them. 
and and certainly I you know enjoy documentaries and and looking at different I don't know approaches and kinds and you know like Robert Flaherty's work or something um you know I think everybody sees in film school in some way or another um uh the you know it I've thought about this a lot like where you know if my background had been in book publishing or something I probably would have tried to pursue a book if um you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of other backgrounds that you could have. I, I do think that, you know, having a background in filmmaking led to the decision of, of making a documentary because I think that was a language that I understood. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I, I don't think I could have like written a blog about it or something, you know, like that's not something easy or, you know, something that comes to me. Um, with a documentary, you know, the, the idea really was to, to try to find out more about Radabon. I think at mm -hmm. first it was to, make something like a short film. Like I, I still remember writing out, um, you know, just a, like a very quick outline, like where I had this idea of reaching out to somebody like Sid Mead, who we eventually got to talk to mm -hmm. and talking to Matt Novak and basically like the people that I knew we could talk to, you know, like talking to uh, Rachel Jarrett and Todd, Matt and Sid, that was probably going to be it. You know, at that mm -hmm. point in time, I was like, that's all we could get. And make you know this fifteen-minute film, kind of talking about like the the role of the futurist and the responsibility of a futurist. You know, a little bit about Radabaugh's life, sprinkling closer than we think. Get out of there, you know. And that was kind of the idea. And you know, just this year, I ended up editing a thirty-minute version of the film that is basically that, and that that I have up on YouTube. And it's it, it is that. It's it's very it's very closer than we think centric, and has very little to do with you know, futurism in general or the man himself. Um, and I think that that version's, you know, fun to see. And I think if you, it's the thing that I wanted to find when I first found his artwork, you know, just something kind of brief, give me a little history, know what I'm looking up at, you know, on the wall. Um, but yeah, like filmmaking was the language that I knew. So I think that that was the reason that I, I went in that way, you know, like, um, The, the thing about documentary that was interesting, I guess, is that, you know, from, I guess, from what I've heard from friends, it's a lot like animation in that way that you can do a little bit, look at it, and kind of redress it, you know, and then film a little bit more, you know, and then see what kind of questions you have and continue. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that we shot this, you know, over the course of like a two year production period mm -hmm. um, was to just kind of piece it together as we figured out interviews and figured out more research. Um, certainly, I think, you know, I'm sure other documentaries are made in different ways and, mm -hmm. you know, film over a much shorter period of time. But that was the way that we did this. It was very much this kind of discovery process and made by a very small team. It's a very like handmade film, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and, and in some ways, like functions as uh, almost like an essay film, you know, to, to me anyway. Um, mm -hmm in, I don't know, structurally, I, I, it feels like an essay to me. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Now, so now you've gone on and I want to, I want to get back to crowdfunding and tell a little bit about that. Cause I think, I think that's of interest to a lot of creative people, but when you went on to do some other, uh, work you know some other documentaries that are about futurism and about this greater thing what is the appeal for you i mean you're looking we're looking at sort of the futuristic visions of the 19 you know 50s and 60s and we're really focused on closer than we think the newspaper strip because it is very much that way you know it's probably the deepest into futurism that you know radabon his work goes uh but what what's the appeal for you what's the interest well, I mean, the, the, the films that I've made after Closer Than We Think are like a direct result of making that documentary, you know, so we never found any video or audio of Arthur Radabaugh. So mm -hmm. after interviewing Rick Guidis, um in the film, you know, who did a lot of work uh, for NASA in the 1970s, um, you know, seeing like these space settlements and, and whatnot that are still, you know, used to illustrate the future today, you know, so mm -hmm. we're 50 years off from that and they're still being used. Um, 
I wanted to be able to capture these uh, oral histories, you know, like I wanted to be able to have these things so that, you know, 50 years from now, we're not going, oh man, I wish we had gotten this artist on camera and, and had something of them. Uh, so that's really where like the artist depiction series kind of comes from. And, you know, that's, a, that's an ongoing series where we're making a third series of that. So at the end of that, you know, we'll have nine films, so nine different oral histories of these space artists and their visions of the future, their techniques, you know, their lives. And I hope that that will be of value to future generations when you're looking back at how people looked at the future. So I guess that's the interesting thing. Uh, and I, th I think Matt touches on that in the film, uh, you know, that it, futurism is always a reflection of the time in which it was created. So yeah. that, that to me is always the fascinating thing. I think futurism is the easiest way for me to look at history um, or at least, you know, recent history of like the last 120 years, I guess, or so, you know, going mm -hmm. back to like HG Wells or something. Um, it's, it's a great vehicle to see how people are thinking about, you know, like what are their concerns for the days moving forward, you know? So like, I always a great example to me is that like, um, if you've seen the film Videodrome, which is like one of my absolute favorite films, no, it, he, he, oh, you have to check it out. Um, it's a David Cronenberg film from 1983. And it's about like fears of the internet. It's about like fears of AI. It's about you know, like all, all of those, you know, digital things, but he's using the tools of VHS and beta because those are the tools that were available to him at the time. Right. So like, that's how he's expressing himself and, and expressing that story. And I think that that's really interesting, you know, so like that's from the 1980s, you know, we're looking at Radabaugh and, you know, it's like, he'll talk about, um, what kind of could sound like the internet. Like, I think I'm thinking of like one world job market or something. And it's always through like cables or like, you know, something that might have a one-to-one -one with like cable TV or something like that, or, you know, like something that would turn into cable TV. Um, so I don't know that, I think that's where the interest comes from is just being able to look at what were the concerns of society at that time by those projections, you know, like what were the fears uh, and what were the hopes as well? Yeah, and I think that's fascinating because I think people think of futurism, they think of, you know, this soothsayer sort of prediction about, you know, what's going to happen in the future? And you're exactly right. It's a, it is a reflection of, of the times and you can't, you can't really look at those future predictions until they're ironically in the past, right? And then we can judge them, right? You know, because, you know, and Radabaugh, you know, his, I don't think his, and you can tell me, uh, you know, in my understanding, it doesn't seem like he was really obsessed with being right or, you know, being this sort of, you know, fortune teller of what was to come. But really just for him, there was something about visually telling the stories of the future. I think that was intriguing. What, why do you think, why do you think he was into that? You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I know that there are a few articles kind of toward the end of his life um, where he talks about, you know, some of his predictions being correct and, you know, how he's kind of just like an old man smoking a cigarette and laughing about how they used to laugh at him, but now he's right. And, you know, Ham Hampton touches on that in the film of this idea of, you know, there are certain things that Radabaugh has, you know, kind of, you know, in quotes predicted that, um, aren't necessarily predictions like they're just things that weren't mainstream you know mm -hmm. so like it, in a lot of ways um when you know you were a person reading uh you know his uh, sunday comic strip that was the way that you were being introduced to these concepts and to these ideas but many times like they were you know actual concepts sometimes they're far out stuff you know like i believe there's you know space monkey colonies and, and some other weird ones, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know if we should go through them. Maybe um, there, there are certainly some, some strange predictions in there, um, but a lot of times, you know, they are like consumer goods, which I, I think is an interesting thing too, because, you know, you're sitting presumably somewhere reading a newspaper and you're like, oh, that's it. I, I could go for something like that. That's interesting. A wristwatch TV. Okay. You know, like that sounds good. Uh, that kind of thing. I don't know exactly if, you know, this was something in the, in the research that I don't know if, if Radabaugh did 
uh, futurist work because it was of the time and it kind of fit in to what he was doing um, and what could sell, or if he had genuine, you know, interest in science fiction or, you know, like uh, kind of the space age or atomic age, you know, like uh, if yeah. that was something that he was reading a lot about, I, I don't, I don't know that exactly. Yeah. It's so interesting. Cause you think about the things that we're focused on, you know, self-driving cars and, you know, what's the future of the space program and, you know, are we all going to be augmented, you know, cybernetically or, you know, visually or bio biologically, but, you know, those are the, those are because of the concerns that we have. And you look at, you know, you go back to 1958, you think about Sputnik, the space race, you know, the atomic, you're saying it's, you know, the rise of atomic power and yeah, he's just taking the concerns of the day and sort of projecting them forward, which I think yeah. is, uh, is, is fascinating, you know, and I think, it's funny because we talk about, we're talking about sort of history. It, this is really the history of the future, right? It's like, what do we, how do we think about the future? And this is a historical take on that from Radabaugh. Let, let's yeah, it, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it's, it's curious also just like how much uh, science is, is related within the strip, you know, and a lot of times it's within the text. Um, you know, it'll talk about, you know, a concept that some scientist has come up with, and then Radabaugh will extrapolate something, you know, bigger and better from that, mm -hmm. or we'll just find it an interesting way that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be the approach of that scientist maybe in making, you know, some sort of concept or model of that idea, but he will illustrate and show you um, a way that it might fit into your life. And I think that that's, that's still a role that, that companies do today, but not necessarily somebody in a, you know, a Sunday comic strip. It feels so interesting and isolated. Like, I'm sure you've looked at like, you know, full newspapers where closer than we think appears. And it's like, you have like Dick Tracy and grandma and then a single panel closer than we think. And you're just like, here's the future, you know? And it's, yeah. it's so interesting that you're not following a story from piece to piece, but you're looking at a, a piece of art, you know, and you can really look into it and explore that world and see little pieces of what he's putting in there. And it's a different story than most of the comics of the time. Yeah, it really stands out. And I, you know, it's, I wish we could conjure him and talk to him here, well, but it, let's, it does, let's try, let's try. <laughs> let's. It does seem like, you know, Arthur Radabaugh was really good at bringing science, these scientific concepts down to a level that you, you read these, you don't feel dumb. You also don't exactly feel talked down to either. You know, I feel like he made this science, you know, whether he's talking about like, you know, he doesn't use these terms, but like the, you know, the coefficient of friction or the, the drag here or, you know, interplanetary orbit. Uh, you know, I think that's so interesting because people think of him as this artist and I don't, I don't, you know, you know, we don't know all the whole story behind it, but how he interacted with the people who helped him write the strip. Uh, right. He, he does a really good job of bringing the science to the masses in a way that was, you know, it, it wasn't pandering, but also it felt maybe you walked away from this, you know, in 19, you know, 60 or 1961, you felt a little bit smarter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the only, um, you know, kind of sibling in some ways, I guess, uh, that I ended up finding, you know, was Athelstan Spillhouse's Our New Age. And, and that ran for, I think it's like 15 years or something and through three different artists and, um, there's a, there's a film about Spillhouse too. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, the experimental city, which is quite good and worth checking out as well. Um, and, and that, you know, was a strip that, you know, president Kennedy had actually said like, you know, this is where I get my science from, you know, I've never heard him talk about closer than we think, but he, he certainly talks about our new age and our new age, but you know, was this multi-panel strip that, really went through like a scientific concept. It wasn't, yeah. you know, fully about the future. So it's interesting to see those differences, you know, like, and I think that's where closer than we think somehow can still, you know, capture people on the internet in that it's, 
it's an image, you know, it's just like, here's a projection of the future. Here it is. It's not like, let me tell you all these things and where we were and where we're going. It's just one image and it can capture you much like, you know, you're walking through a museum and you see a painting and it just speaks to you. I think that Radabaugh's work certainly, you know, does that same thing. Yeah, it does feel a lot less didactic, right? And, you know, you can tell this is f rather than from the hand of an educator where, you know, it's like, you know, that's that strip feels that way, whereas closer than we think, it feels like it's, it's coming from the hand of an artist, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, let's talk about, uh, let's talk, about, I want to go back to more about, you know, the overall, you know, arc of Radabaugh's life, you know, so he did all of this art, you know, he did work in automotive illustration, you know, he worked for the, you know, the big auto companies, he's from Detroit, I don't want to spoil the whole documentary. Um, no, no, uh, it's his life, I think that's, yeah. that's all fine. <laughs> but, you know, so he goes there, and then, you know, one of the things, he kind of switches gears, right, you know, he sort of pivots with the times as photography starts to you know, sort of take over for, uh, you know, the kind of illustration that he did, he switches gears and he goes to a really different medium. You know, we actually before closer than we think, uh, we don't see this kind of strip. I mean, really, he's a cartoonist here. But, uh, you know, he doesn't have the same cartoon, you know, the cartoonist bona fides. I mean, I remember talking with uh, Caitlin McGurk at the Billy Ireland School of, uh, car you know, the Cartoon Museum. Uh, she said, you know, he's, he drew cartoons, but he, was he really a cartoonist? I don't know. I want to hear your thoughts on that sort of evolution, that reinvention that he has. Well, I, I think that's, that's where it's interesting to bring in, can you imagine the kind of strip that he was doing before Closer Than We Think? Because that's like the, the, you know, really is like the prequel to it. You know, can like you he even re can you describe what yeah. that is? So, so from, from my research and, and correct me if wrong, you know, like it, it kind of appeared on almost random pages of the newspaper, you know, like it, it wasn't in a Sunday comic strip kind of section. It would appear next to some advertisements or something and just kind of show you like a concept and be like, Hey, one day the dog is going to walk itself with this little leash or something, you know, mm -hmm. Something like that, you know, like um, set the alarm for 555 and, you know, your coffee maker will start making coffee for you, you know, and that's it. It would just be that, you know, just mm -hmm. these little thoughts of like, oh, hey, you'll be able to do this in the future. The future of America is bright, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if, if you don't have, can you imagine, closer than we think looks really weird in his life story, <laughs> you know, because, yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, he's he's working, um, you know, f for all these automakers. He's illustrating cars with, again, you know, so like to talk a little bit about his, his car illustration work, you have, you know, the cars that I, you know, just assume are, you know, designed by the companies and he has little wiggle room on what he can really do there. But the backgrounds are, you know, the things that are always striking about Radabaugh's automotive work, you know, is that they're living in these futuristic places, you know, like you look behind and you're like, what, that's a city I've never seen before. You know, like that's, that's where we're going. You know, that's the promise of where America is headed in this post-World War II, you know, kind of landscape. And I think, you know, like, I know that he was doing, can you imagine, um, at the same time as doing that automotive work. So it was kind of like, he was like moonlighting kind of doing that. Um, and then, yeah, once, and that was one of the most fascinating things that I never planned on learning about was this transition, you know, from illustration work to photography and how that took away jobs. Those jobs changed, you know, and talking to Jim Secreto in the film about that was, was very interesting. And he was so helpful, even in just in, in me not knowing anything about that in understanding that and seeing how that shifted and what those artists had to do. And certainly I think that's what Radabaugh was doing was just like, well, how can I still do something I love drawing and transition to something else that maybe isn't, you know, what I, I, you know, I don't know how much he wanted to be doing automotive illustration, but I guess it's what, you know, was paying and paying the bills at that time. Which, you know, again, makes me question that whole line of like, is he into science fiction or is he doing it because that could pay the bills and that's something that came to him, you yeah. know, which it, all indications seem to be that a lot of these concepts kind of came to him, you know, that these were not, not necessarily visions that he had, but something that he could see clearly, you know, like as an artist anyway, of just, you know, what's the layout, what's the concept and 
kind of get it from there. But I, I think that's, that's, that's the, you can see that transition um, more clearly by seeing Can You Imagine? So he's already moonlighting doing this. Now he's going to move to it full time since, you know, automotive illustration is moving to photography for their advertising. Yeah, and it's interesting because that previous strip, can you imagine, was all airbrushed, right? So, I mean, to, and my understanding is that was like a visual feature, right? The idea that if you were a newspaper, you, you know, subscribed to a syndicate, you could pull from this. If you had a space on, you know, page E7, you could plop, you know, this Radabach, can you imagine, you know, strip this visual feature because it didn't have a, a home necessarily. I mean, it seemed like some papers had a regular space for it, but it didn't exactly have a home. And then you see him transition to this much less, uh, you know, sort of time intensive version of his art, right? He goes from this, you know, very, very time intensive uh, airbrush process of these single panels to, you know, much more complex illustration, but it has to be done on a deadline. And I, you want to talk about the illustration style there because we see a change from the very first, you know, the very first strips. And as you go on, you see a change in the art style. Yeah, and I, I think uh, when you look at the original artwork also, you see that he was working with a bigger board and mm -hmm. he, he makes it smaller. I guess at some point maybe he realized that he's like, why am I doing this? Why am I making it this big for something that's going to be printed this big? Um, but yeah, over time, you certainly see even just his use of, well, I mean, you know, I guess the, the use of color by the newspapers and what he would, you know, kind of guide toward um, ends up being very different too. Um, in the beginning, I, I do think that the strip starts off, you know, like as almost like this, uh, you know, sequel to Can You Imagine? And it is kind of big, sprawling airbrush paintings. And I, I do think that, you know, more line work kind of comes in. You see more people than I think you had seen before. Um, and they're not necessarily like, I can't remember, what, what is that term of the, the, people that uh are in there I, I can't remember what it is but there there is like a, a term that caitlin had told me and it's uh, escaping me now of that they're they're essentially just like kind of generic people that are mm -hmm. in the illustrations so I, I think you see like added complexity in closer than we think as as the strip goes on um but then there's also a simplicity to it that you're moving away from uh the airbrush work um you know, like really kind of just broad, magnificent strokes of, of, of the art um, and, and moving into something that, that feels sustainable, I'm sure, for him. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What's your take on that? I, I'm curious to hear that. You know, being able to look at it was pretty eye opening. Uh, you know, come, I came at Radaboff from the, the airbrush illustrations and, uh, you know, so that's a, yeah, we had we had completely flipped. Uh, yeah, <laughs> discoveries right. of Radaboff. And my initial was like, you look at, you know, 1960s uh, newsprint printing and you're like, Ugh, you know, it, some of it looks like it's kind of a muddy mess, right? Because you've got you've got four color printing, but it's on, you know, something that's just a step above toilet paper, you know, in terms of paper quality. Right. So it, it feels really soft. But seeing the original artwork, I think, was really eye opening for me because then you see like some of the, you know, the very first strips he was using an airbrush and you could see him do that. And then I think you look at that versus how that was reproduced and he started doing it probably for this, I'm guessing for the sake of time, but also for just how it reproduced. And uh, one of the things I thought was really cool is wearing the white gloves, you know, in the, in the uh, museum, but being able to touch the paper, he was using a stippled paper and he would, he would do his shading, a real light shading, running a pencil over the stippled paper to get this texture so it was a way for him to do texture that he would maybe have done otherwise, uh, you know, airbrushing, you know, this really, you know, stippled, you know, not solid blacks, but really showing some, you know, medium grays. And he did it with a pencil and he did it with this, you know, the stippled paper, which apparently is, was a trick of the trade, at least at that time. Um, you know, and I, I, ha I had a lot more, uh, re I respect the art before, but really seeing it, you know, in hand, I think you really get to see the detail like, you know, he really knew how to bring characters to the forefront. He really knew how to design, um, you know, vehicles and like, you know, how to push some things into the back and bring others to the front. Uh, and uh, I think he deserves, you know, 
to be up there with like some of these great cartoonists, even though I don't know that he would have considered himself a cartoonist. I, you know, at least in my reading, he never called himself that. Yeah, no, I, do, I don't know how, I mean, besides, you know, calling himself an Imagineer, um, you know, that's kind of the, the name that he gave himself, you know, that Disney also enjoys using. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do feel like we would be uh, remiss to leave out um, that the fact that he was doing at least some of these years work in this, you know, closer than we think van where, uh, you know, like he had closer than we think written on the side, it looked like this little mobile studio, you know, that he had. Um, and I can only imagine the, the fumes that he was probably breathing in and that very enclosed space um, with paints of the time. But I, I do think it's it's an interesting idea to think of it as, you know, this kind of lone person working on this. And there's something very romantic about that to me as well. You know, just kind of dreaming up these concepts of where we can all go as a society and, you know, as, as you know, just humanity in general um, and and being alone. You know, and I think uh, many of us probably have experienced his art in that way of just kind of seeing it, you know, on a computer monitor or on a phone or something and being alone and just thinking about it and, you know, like what it was and what it could be. And I, I don't know, I, I often will still think about like what it was like for him in that time and creating that. Uh, art in that van and what what that was like you know like did he just not have space in his home did he want to get away from his wife did he just was he just an extreme introvert you know like I don't know those answers and I I still like that there is that mystery to it yeah you know I, it's funny because my take and again this is all conjecture right we're not sure but you know it's my take is that you know making art like this for decades and decades which is what he did is very much a solitary pursuit right i mean it's you and your drawing board right i mean you can be in the you know and i i imagine him sort of working for some of these ad agencies you know in the bullpen where you've got you know you've got desks lined up next to desk and you can chit chat and all that stuff but you know on the whole it's sort of a you know it's a solitary pursuit right but then you think about him, he seemed to be an introvert with this really like self-promotional side, right? Where like who pan paints the side of their van with the strip and suggesting that, yes, this thing was going to drive around the Detroit area. And when it was driving, you knew that Arthur Radabaugh was in the back, you know, drawing away, you know, like that was, that was the conceit, right? I, maybe this thing sat parked in his driveway most of the time. I don't really know. I mean, I think we had... I think I had talked to somebody who said, you know, his wife would drive him around. I mean, I just. I oh, mean, really? I, I've never known that. I, I don't know. I've never heard that before. That's yeah, new to me. Yeah. And That's so, I, I mean, is there anything more 50s and more Detroit than that? I mean, it, I, it sort of reminds me of the billboards today that you see driving around and, and their, their whole goal is to, you know, drive around so you'll see this billboard. I mean, is there anything that's like worse for the environment than a car that just constantly drives around? But, but, you know, I mean, that's very 50s. But I don't know. He, he felt like a little bit of a showman. Even the way, you know, you could... I think some of the research is just even finding this strip. It doesn't say Arthur Radabaugh. It says Radabaugh, as if everyone should know he was this sort of magical, mystical guy, you know, that you knew him like you knew Cher, right? You know, with one name only, you know, and I think, uh, I don't know, he, he always seemed like in interviews, it was this persona. It felt like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't talking about it as if it was marketing. It was just this mysterious tales that he was weaving. And uh, I don't know, there it seems like there was a lot of, uh, he had a self-promotional sort of a marketing mind. Well, that's, that's what to me, I, I think in how kind of big some of those interview, those print interviews, you know, are, or kind of come off, um, to me still feels like there's something hiding, you know, like, I think that there's like a layer of someone else there, you know, I, I it's hard to speculate, you know, further than that, but like, certainly it just, it, it feels like he's always kind of putting on like a, a performance or something in any print interview that he did. Um, and, and yeah, and I remember like, you know, looking up at the art and wondering who it was and stuff and seeing that where you're like, Oh, it says closer than we think by Radabaugh. 
okay. You know, and it's like, have to Google Radabaugh and then, you know, eventually find like, oh, Arthur Radabaugh. Okay. You know, and then going from, you're like, oh, Arthur Charles Radabaugh, you know, and you're like, okay, you know, and you just keep kind of peeling by back layers. But yeah, like the way that it was created in the fifties and early sixties, it does feel like there is this assumption of like, you know who I am, you know, here it is. And this is what I'm doing now. You know, like it's, it's very much, there's really a branding to it. Totally, totally. And I think that's really interesting in that, you know, I've interviewed lots of artists, you know, visual artists, and, you know, some of them are some of the most, you know, warm, eloquent people that you've ever met. And some of them you're like, oh, I see why you like to spend 10 hours a day closed in a room by yourself, right? You know, there's just, there, there's something about that sort of introverted nature. And he really seemed like he, you know, either he's putting on a great show or he had a little bit, you know, there was a little bit of an extra version that he wanted more than just that solitary life in terms of, you know, being sort of the life of the party and being a little jovial and being slightly mysterious in the way that he uh, presented himself to the world. I mean, but you're right, there's a branding aspect, uh, which makes me want to talk about one of the fun things that I think you, I can't remember if you mentioned in the film or not, about how he would draw himself into the strip regularly. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was one of my favorite, like, discoveries. Like, once I knew what he looked like, you know, I remember thinking, that wait, that guy's in, like, one of the strips. Like, I definitely recognize that. Um, and you can find, I think there's over 20. And, and actually, I think in 61, um, he appears in a number of them in a row. Like, he's just all over the place. And it, it feels like this, like, bid for immortality, you know, like, to kind of put yourself into your work and put yourself into your work that takes place in the future, you know? Mm -hmm. So like he would never make it there. And that was the only, this was the only way that he ever did. And again, that's like a very romantic idea to me. That's extremely poetic, you know, to think about this, this man who creates the future, created a future for himself. Yeah. You know, having said that though, he also appears in like, um, what is it like automatic storage, units or something something where he's in the hospital and he's dying there's another one actually where you can read a newspaper that says like radabaugh given last rights you know like that there's there's a lot to that um but i i i think in the film caitlin says that he's like kind of like a narrator to his pieces i don't know that i necessarily agree with that um i i think it's more of you know he's putting himself in the future to kind of protect himself to kind of put himself in there in this like hitchcock-esque cameo you know and he had that great that great stamp i know we've both seen i don't th i don't th that's not in the film but um you know of this like caricature of of him and he's kind of portly with the glasses and i can't recall if he has like the ascot but i remember talking you know with yeah. people that knew him you know saying like he would wear a monocle and he had the ascot and it was very like you know, a, a kind of a big dresser in that way, you know, um, it, it, it kind of reminds me of like Wes Anderson or something, you know, <laughs> or a great twee or something, you know, like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I think I, I, the thing I got out is just seeing him, you know, and you can see this much better in the large original art of closer than we think rather than, you know, when it's, once it's been scaled down to that big, you know, him just showing up in all these places, it's just, it's fun. He's having fun with it. And he's not idealizing himself either. I mean, he's, you know, he's painting himself as a middle-aged, portly guy, you know? And, you know, I mean, he's like this, you know, his stomach, you know, his big stomach and, you know, like small feet, you know, he's just having a good time with it. And I think, uh, I feel like, you know, it's sort of a sign that's like, hey, if you know who I am, then more power to you but i'm just have, gonna have a good time with this it's sort of an easter egg and i don't take myself that seriously so you don't have to take this you know deathly seriously and i think that's the difference between this and sort of some of the more educational you know strips that came before it that uh you know this was fun this was meant to be light it was meant to be we don't see a lot of dystopia here you know uh, either by himself yes i mean there's a little newspaper you know newspaper headlines you know radabaugh's basically died but yeah. you know he's st he's still doing it all tongue firmly planted in cheek and i think that's what sort of appeals to me is that uh you know maybe it's a reflection of the times maybe the fact that you know he was middle class 
white and pretty, you know, reasonably well off, you know, how bad were things? You know, maybe things were pretty well and this was an extension of that. But it also felt to me like, okay, we can approach the future in a positive way and we don't have to fear it. Yeah, there's very few that are pretty dystopian. I, I know that, you know, in the film, Caitlin has that view. And I, I, I certainly agree with uh, aspects of what she's saying of like, you know, you're living in a, a glassed in house, you know, like that's, you know, you're, uh, there's, you know, a whole like polar city, you know, there's destruction of the environment spun as like a positive, you know, there's these colossal crops that are like straight out of like Woody Allen sleeper or something, you know, mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, there are, you know, there's, um, it's one that I'm trying to remember the name of it, catastrophe picker upper, you know, that it's like, well, yes, some bad things happened, but we have the tools to clean it up quickly and well, you know, so like there are hints of dystopia, but yeah, overall, I do think that it's a, it's a very utopian strip. And I mean, I, I don't know how much of that grows out of the idea of like, well, it's a Sunday comic strip, you know, how much of a bummer do you want to be? Um, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think if, if Catastrophe Pick Her Up or happens like either right before or after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so that, you know, that's interesting timing, you know, like when, when again, talking about futurism being a reflection of the time, uh, you know, was that a thing that was on Radabaugh's mind, whether consciously or subconsciously or just kind of in the ether of the time? Um, you know, like, is that where that idea came from? You know, like, I, I'm not exactly sure where some of these dystopian things you know have how long they've been percolating in his mind that's even looking at his art pre-world war ii uh to post-world war ii where it's actually kind of hopeful coming out of coming out of world war ii and you know it feels like there's some concern for fascism you know like in in a pre-world war ii radaba artwork you know, especially yeah. the stuff that he did for like motor magazine Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think it's interesting. I think it is a reflection of the times. I don't think it's naivete. I think it was just in the air. You know, oh, we're the United States. We came in and we won World War II and we, you know, the government can solve your problems and we trust the government and we, you know, this is pre-Nixon. This is pre-JFK's assassination. I mean, you know, I mean, all these things that we can do, we will solve these problems, you know, through this combination of government and technology and industry, you know, and hard work, you know, this American rolling up your sleeves, you know, I don't think that was, I think it was just in the ethos. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly it feels that way. You know, like it's, it's a shame that we never get to see the strip, you know, post Kennedy's assassination. Like I would have loved to have seen, you know, just would the art have changed, you know, even his strip afterward, after that, Jet Swift and the science stamps, ends right before the Kennedy assassination. So we're going, you know, right after Sputnik to right before Kennedy. It's such a crucial time in American history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have Radabaugh's thoughts week after week after week, you know, there's over what's 250 something, you know, strips. Uh, it's a real key into his mind. Um, and, and at that specific time in history it's like the coolest one week journal you know that you could get out of somebody like i really do see it as a reflection of of things that were on his mind and concepts that he you know kind of did and redid throughout his life as an artist mm -hmm. yeah totally no and I, I think it's it's these same ideas sort of preoccupied him and you know and it's hard to know unless we talk to him you know was he really this you know hey i'm you know, anybody who talked to him in a cocktail party or, you know, at a, you know, soda fountain, would, would he be talking about, you know, the same thing, you know, these pogo cars, you know, or things, you know, concepts that he revisited over multiple years. Was it just something he knew he could draw on deadline, right? right. Or, was it, yeah. or was it something that, uh, you know, preoccupied him? I mean, maybe we'll never know. I'm not sure. Yeah, and if anyone out there has any more information about Arthur Radabaugh, please go to unsolved.com and, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but you know, I mean, that that has always been my hope, you know, that we find somebody who presumably now would be, you know, 90 years old and was like, I was Radabaugh's best friend. And I remember everything, you know, and I wrote down everything he said, you know, that would be, I don't even know how I would process that information. I, I would think immediately, I'm like, this is fake. This is like the Howard Hughes will, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I, 
I don't, yeah, I, I wish we could, you know, I really wish we could talk to him in some way. Um, it's the, it eats at me sometimes and it probably shouldn't, but it, it certainly does. Well, you know, I, you've talked about this sort of responsibility, this idea of, you know, we're not to put it, not to put too fine a point on it. Right. But, you know, feeling like the custodian of this history, you know, in a sense, um, you know, I think, you know, I look at that as being a benefit, right? It's not, not just responsibility, but maybe a benefit of being the first, one of the first people to sort of put that out there in a way that more, many more people can, can be inspired by it, but also be educated and sort of putting something out there that didn't, that didn't really exist. I mean, you're curating all this stuff over the course of years and putting it in a film, uh, you know, that people can, you know, can absorb, they can sort of let that come into their own sort of inspirations and in that way you're sort of keeping this radabayan i don't know if that is that a is that a phrase like his legacy it is alive. now it is it now. Isn't that radabayan yeah <laughs> it's a little hard to say um <laughs> yeah i mean it's certainly for me you know like um one of the things uh matt touches on in the film you know is this comparison to the jetsons and how i think the jetsons is whenever people think about futurism, you know, if you say the Jetsons to nearly anybody, they'll know what you're talking about. Whether or not, you know, they've watched an episode in the last 20 years or they've just seen a flying car go by or something, the Jetsons became the easiest shorthand for our society um, to talk about the future. You know, you could just say the Jetsons. Uh, no one is saying, you know, oh, it's like closer than we think. But, you know, we show right. a lot of parallels between uh, Radabaugh's, you know, very sincere, earnest work uh, for Closer Than We Think, and then, you know, the parody version of that that's on the Jetsons. And maybe the easiest thing that we can all do as humans is to, you know, sit and see something and laugh. And that might be easier than trying to talk about, you know, intellectual concepts and how they can be better for humanity. But, you know, I would like it to be maybe both. <laughs> um, yeah. And cer certainly, you know, something that I would like people to... Uh, come away from the film with is, is, you know, just to kind of see and acknowledge all of this other work that was being done, you know? So like, if you're familiar with the Jetsons, great, let's dig a little deeper and see like, well, where did that come from? And where did that come from? You know, and just and see more of it. And I don't know, that's, that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And I think, uh, I mean, that's a great legacy to get people interested in it, sort of stoke their curiosity, not just about the time period and about Arthur Radabaugh, but, you know, just about the the larger weave, the contextual, you know, culture that, you know, this comes from. And I think you've really done that with the film well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now, before, before we wrap up, I did want to talk about that, like, the search and the, you know, the, the work on Radabaugh is not over. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the project that we're working on together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the idea as of now, you know, is to do a book about Radabaugh and uh, Radabaugh's life and Radabaugh's art. And uh, I know both of us are still, you know, collecting Radabaugh art. And, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like, the search never ends, you know, I mean, finished the film a, a, a quite a bit ago now. Um, but it's, it's in my mind every day, you know, like I think just, just uh, a few days ago, you know, I had received someone's scrapbook that I got from eBay, you know, and there were strips in there I had never seen in mm -hmm. newspaper forum like that, you know, so like it certainly continues and hopefully I don't know what year the book will come out or anything, but hopefully it will be like, you know, to me, it's important that it's the definitive kind of look at, this is everything we could find and this is everything that we have and look at this man's artwork, you know, like I think it really deserves a place in history. Yeah, totally. And I'm excited about like doing the, you know, you did a wonderful job in the film of sort of introducing people to his art and the, and what we know about the man and hearing those voices, you know, that were sort of connected to his life. And I think that's like that. I mean, that's the power of not only your film, but just film in general, and then to take a different approach and be able to do something, you know, that you know, spans a longer term in terms of print and really have that down and have that be a resource and an asset and have, you know, and be a starting point for people, you know, and I don't, you know, will we be able to create the definitive only ever, you know, work of Arthur Radabaugh? Maybe not, but I would love to take the first stab and really like put it out there into the world 
and uh, you know share in a different fashion than your film about you know who was this guy, you know what was his what was the arc of his career, and uh, how has it influenced us today? So that's that that's pretty exciting, and you know we we will get to it. You know it's you know I think there's you know you got to juggle the projects. We've got to find the things we want to find, you know. And uh, but I'm excited, and I know that eventually it will see the light of day. Yeah, and it's it's that great difference between you know time based art and you know, non time based time based art that, you know, like the film is 85 minutes, you know, and I, I hope it's a, a good introduction, you know, and you, you get to an end and, you know, probably the most common question I think I received when we were taking this around to festivals was like, well, where can I get a book of his work? You know, like mm -hmm. by far it was, you know, the thing of like, well, I saw something interesting, you know, in watching the film, but I wanted to look at it for longer, you know, and I mean, certainly, you know, if you're watching it on uh, Labo Cine here, um, you can pause it, you know, so like it's not the same as the festival setting, mm -hmm. but really, I mean, you want it in a nice size book where you can really examine it and really take a look at it and really admire uh, the, the artwork, you know, for what it is. Awesome. Cool. No, that's great. And I think that's totally a hope too. Well, this has been great. I, I always enjoy talking with you. Uh, you know, it's thank great you for to, doing this. Yeah. 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 You bet. And it's fun to, you know, talk about this artist and sort of pluck him out of history and, uh, you know, shine a spotlight, which I think you, your film does incredibly well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, uh, is there any other place that people can go for more information after they've got a chance to watch the film and your other uh, projects? Yeah, definitely. You know, a bunch of other things going on. Um, easiest thing is to check out, I guess, my website, which is uh, clindar.net. So that's C-L-I-N-D-A-R.net. Um, and yeah, there's more information about Closer Than We Think, um, where it's available, but also, you know, watch it here on Lambo City. Um, and uh, yeah, and everything else that we're doing with uh, artist depiction and uh, other new projects. So, yeah. what, what about you, Tim? What are you doing now? Awesome. Uh, you know, I'm continuing to work on, you know, pop culture and design and sort of where those things meet. I'm working on a book about the history of Pac-Man and I uh, have some other things that are sort of pop cultural and, you know, where pop culture and sort of art and design meet uh, that'll be coming down the pike too. So timlapatino.com or I'm on all the social media, the normal social media outlets with that stuff. Cool. Very excited. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Brad. This is a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You bet.